On this week's show, how the Canadian Armed Forces are helping stave off potential Russian aggression and what our military needs to help itself. I'm Mercedes Stevenson, and the West Block starts now. Canada's largest international deployment is in Latvia, a key location in a region vulnerable to Russian aggression. We talk with the Latvian Defence Minister about new attempts to strengthen its border with Russia. And as we prepare to send even more troops to Latvia, a dire warning about the state of our military from Canada's Defence Minister himself. More people have left than have, have entered. That is, is frankly, it's, 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 it's a death spiral for the Canadian Armed Forces. We've made NATO stronger than ever. We welcomed Finland to the alliance last year. And just this morning, Sweden officially joined. Mr. Prime Minister, welcome to NATO, the strongest military alliance the world has ever seen. That was President Biden at the State of the Union. With NATO's borders now expanding, do alliance countries like Latvia, who share a border with Russia, feel reassured? Canadian troops are on the ground in the small Baltic country. In fact, it is Canada's largest military deployment of about 1,000 soldiers, and it's growing. It's also a long-term commitment for Canada, much like Germany was during the Cold War. When the Liberal government is grilled over NATO spending, they often point to the troops in Latvia as an example of Canada's NATO contributions. We are renewing and expanding our contributions to Operation Reassurance. This includes increased financial and troop commitments that will scale up the Canadian-led NATO battle group to a brigade by 2026. Is it enough to deter Russia, and do Canadian troops cancel out the need to spend more on NATO? With more on this, I'm joined by Latvian Defence Minister Andras Sprudz. Minister Sprudz, thank you so much for taking time during your visit to Canada, and welcome. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. It's a great privilege. Latvia is an incredible country. I've, I've had the pleasure of being there twice, once when Canadian troops first deployed, and then again right after the war started uh, of Russia invading Ukraine. And one of the things that really struck me is it is a country that is right on the front line with Russia. You share a border. You share a border with Belarus, another country that supports Russia. So there's tremendous geographic vulnerability that the average Canadian doesn't feel or experience. What is the situation right now in Latvia in terms of concern about that border with Russia and Russia's desire for Latvian territory? Well, I think we all should be concerned about what is Russia. Russia is an imperialistic dictatorship. It kills people inside Russia. It, of course, kills people also in other countries, namely now in brutal war and its aggression against Ukraine. So that's why, of course, we should be concerned about different kind of scenarios, and we are ready also for different kind of scenarios. Uh, and uh, But it's not something new for us. I mean, we've been living next to Russia already for years, for decades. Uh, we've been living in circumstances of hybrid warfare with weaponization of illegal migration, with cyber attacks, with incidents against critical infrastructure already for some time. So we've been uh, mentally and also militarily ready. But I should also underline it's not a Latvian territory, or not only Latvian territory, it's a NATO territory. We are on the same boat. We are on the same sort of page in how we should deal with such kind of concerns and threats. Russia is identified as a threat by all NATO countries. So that's why, of course, Latvia, together with allies, together with Canadians, are very much ready to defend every inch of NATO territory. And Latvia, of course, is a part of NATO. So that's why it's not just that somehow Latvia can be distinguished because attack against one country or any kind of sort of activities against one country, it means that it's activities or war against all countries involved. Uh, part of the logic um, I've been told by Canadian and American officials to putting Canadian troops in Latvia, which is our, our largest foreign deployment and growing, was that the Russians would know that there's not only a NATO country they're going into, but North American NATO troops who are present, that that would be a significant deterrent. Do you think that that is enough to prevent Russia from moving towards Latvia? Yes, absolutely. I mean, this is a significant deterrent. It's a significant element to defense as well. Of course, we have a battle group which is now being 
scaled up to the brigade size. So we are moving to the brigade size, the battle group of brigade size presence in Latvia. Of course, uh, Canadians are taking the leading role, the framework nation status, the unified approach. It is the best defense, but of course, it's also the serves as the best deterrent in uh, di different kind of circumstances when you have exactly in your proximity such a neighbor as Russia. Canada, of course, doesn't spend 2% of GDP, unlike your country, which I believe spends more than 2% of your GDP on defense. How important do you think it is for countries like Canada to increase their defense spending? Or do you think the argument the Canadian government makes, which is that our, our presence and our personnel make up for the fact that we don't spend that much money? 2% is important. Uh, is important in a wider NATO context. It's important because it shows that there is solidarity and threat assessment and understanding that there are common things what we should do together actively and of course sh uh, fair uh, burden sharing is very important. It is also about credibility. If we take commitments we should of course deal with those commitments very seriously. Once more Latvia and I think uh, also all our allies uh, very much appreciate and highly praise Canadian contribution. At the same time, of course, apparently there are also things what we can all do and 2% is important. Latvia treats it very seriously. Actually, already this year we are approaching 3% uh, military expenditure from our GDP. Uh, of course, also our neighbors are also taking seriously. So that's why it is, of course, about a bilateral interaction and cooperation. It's about unilateral strengthening or national strengthening of our defense. It's of course also about commitments and credibility of alliance as a whole. Out of 32 countries, even the beginning of the year it was 11 countries reaching 2% thresholds. And by end of the year it already will be 18 countries and perhaps even close to 20 countries. There's some concern about Ukraine and the war right now and, and how they're managing to sustain. It's obviously been very difficult. And some folks are saying the war could be getting closer to a pivotal point, that the Ukrainians aren't having as many victories as NATO and the West would like to see. Are you concerned about vulnerability there? Of course, we expect uh, successes and victories, but the war is brutal. And let's not uh, overestimate what Russia is, but let's not also, of course, underestimate. Russia has been able to adjust. Of course, it is country which absolutely demonstrates a negligence for the human life. And of course, this is, if I would not say advantage, but this is what should be taken, unfortunately, tragically into account. But it's important, of course, to support Ukraine because Ukraine not only fights for itself, it fights for the credibility of your Atlantic or transatlantic community. It fights for our values. It fights for a rules-based order, which is so much important for such countries as Latvia and Canada, but of course also for the old democratic uh, rules uh, obeying and complying with uh, nations. Donald Trump has discussed the possibility of getting rid of NATO. What would that mean for a country like Latvia? Well, of course, we follow closely what's happened also in the United States, but let's also put into the context. If you look back, also Donald Trump presidency, yes, there was sometimes harsh wording, but if you look at the deeds, uh, United States remained a very staunch supporter of unified approach. Of course, inviting for burden sharing for 2% as well. Uh, and of course, at the same time, contributing to security. I mean, back in 2017, 2021, during the Trump presidency, Baltic countries, Eastern flank actually received additional support and presence of U.S. military uh, than before. And that's why actually we can look that the U.S. remain and will remain the important strategic and indispensable part within the NATO alliance. Minister Sprutz, thank you so much for coming in and joining us today, and we wish you a safe trip back to Latvia. Thank you so much as well. It's a pleasure being here, so thank you. Up next, candid concerns about the state of our military. From recruitment to readiness, the state of the Canadian military is in the spotlight, and not in a good way. The concerns about the Canadian Armed Forces have been real for years, but now the Minister of National Defence himself has underlined it very publicly. Thank you all very much. Merci beaucoup. It happened when I sat down with Bill Blair in Ottawa at the Conference on Security and Defence, where he was unexpectedly candid. Over the past three years, more people have left than have, have entered. That is, is frankly, it's, 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 it's a death spiral for the Canadian Armed Forces. We cannot afford 
to continue on that pace. We've got to do something differently. The shortage of troops joining the military and the number leaving has been an issue the head of the Canadian Forces has been raising for years. So, Mr. Chair, this is a, a challenge that uh, not only every Western military is facing, but we're facing it here at home as well. Speaking to the Parliamentary Committee on Public Safety and National Security in 2022, General Eyre identified this as one of his concerns. I am very, very worried uh, about our uh, our numbers, and we need, that's why we're putting it as a priority effort, the priority effort, the reconstitution of uh, of our military. Since then, the Canadian Armed Forces have tried to get creative in attracting folks who may not have traditionally joined the military. They've changed some of the standards. Men now can have long hair. Women can wear nail polish. You can dye your hair any color. And they introduced signing bonuses. But has that been enough to turn things around? And are they focusing on the right things? Joining me now is former Chief of the Defence Staff, retired General Tom Lawson. Great to see you. Thank you for coming in, General Lawson. Thanks for having me, Mercedes. I was really struck by the candor of a Minister of National Defence who often say, you know, we're working hard, everything's fine. Term what's happening with recruitment and retention and the number of people in the Canadian Armed Forces as a death spiral. What did you think of that? Well, candor is good. You know, in, whenever you get candor from a, a political a representative, uh, you know you're uh, now going to deal with the issue. A, a little concerning that some of that seems to be directed at the military that he's in charge of, and, and he's becoming impatient with them. Uh, my sense is that those aren't where the issues lie. The issues are uh, in other areas uh, of recruiting and retention. Well, and let's, uh, I've got his speech in front of me just to fill folks in on, on some of the areas because it took me by surprise a little bit too when he openly said the military have asked us to be patient and he said, quote, we can't be patient. There's a sense of urgency. He's asking military leaders to reconsider some of the things that have been in place for many years for recruitment that he believes are slowing things down. It includes things like who's eligible, getting rid of what he called outdated medical requirements, creating a probation period so that people can get in and get started instead of waiting for the background check they require and speeding those background checks up. Do you think that those are, are reasonable areas to look at and valid criticism? Certainly. I, I think that those are reasonable. Anytime we've got uh, a, a, a defense minister who is that aware of the problems associated with uh, recruiting, uh, it's going to add impetus to fix these things. But my uh, assessment is that the military officers, the leadership, the armed forces, have been seized on these things. For instance, uh, the clearance, uh, the security clearances that he talks about, is not something that's held by the Canadian Armed Forces. We're a customer on those things to those security agencies that look after them. That's been a barrier since I was chief of de defense to getting people in quickly. So a lot of these things would have, I think, surprised the military officers who were hearing the same thing, may have even supplied some of this to the minister and it's being used against them. The good news is there's candor there and uh, it's certainly uh, a very positive thing that the minister knows that number one priority is getting people in. Procurement and all kinds of other things, training, uh, readiness, those are important things. But without people, there's no hope. With people, there's hope. Well, and he said that there was about the, the minister about 16,000 people short in the regular and reserve forces. Uh, that's a pretty big number for a country the size of Canada. But I know we were chatting just before this about what the numbers look like. Look like and, and there's some speculation that 16,000 might actually be low, that there could be far more than that the Canadian forces are short on. Yeah, I, I think it is. I think that number's low. It may have been swept up when you look at the open spots in the reserves uh, that could be low. Uh, my understanding, and uh, by a recent briefing by the uh, Chief of Defence uh, to uh, a gathering of the ex-Chiefs of Defence indicated that that death spiral is now uh, evening out. So nearly as many people got in last year as got out. That's not great news when you need to get back these at least 16,000 people and maybe more. But the fact is it's a whole lot better than the couple of years before where attrition uh, far uh, outstripped recruiting. Well, one of the challenges is it's, it's not one for one. If you have, you know, a master warrant officer who served in Afghanistan, has been all over the world, has been a leader for many years, and, and she gets out, this young private coming in, well, he's, he's not a one for one replacement because it takes so long to build up. So what do you do about this retention issue? I keep hearing from the troops that morale is at the lowest point that they have seen in years. It's been many years since Afghanistan. They feel sometimes that they are unsupported by the public or by the government. 
how do you convince those people to stay in a job that's very difficult, requires them to risk their life, uh, and in many cases they're struggling now to, to pay their bills? You're right. Well, first of all, these are great jobs. And those people who uh, are suffering from low morale now are in a little bit of despair because these are great jobs and they loved handling them like the uh, female warrant you just talked about. She wants to stay in uh, and yet there are things that uh, concern her so greatly that she might get out. Uh, happily, the same sort of thing that can deal with recruiting can deal with retention and deal with some of this 2% uh, that we're uh, at being asked to invest in the Canadian military. The Canadian Armed Forces, uh, uh, there's nobody complains about what the Canadian Armed Forces are being paid. Nobody says the Canadian Armed Forces are overpaid. Um, so I, I think that there's an opening there to make the Armed Forces not only okay paid, but remarkably well paid with remarkable benefits so that you can compete with any organization, outstrip other organizations out there. So that will start to address, it'll, it'll start to make it a uh, an attractive uh, organization to join and a place to start the career for a lot of young people uh, now who may not consider that, but the same sort of increase in pay and benefits keep those other people in and adds to the 1.38 investment we've got right now when I'm speaking GDP, moves it towards that 2% and that money stays in Canada. As we look around the world, it's, it's apparent that the security situation is quite dire. And, you know, not only are you dealing with groups like ISIS or the Houthis uh, that bring me back to thinking about, you know, 2014 or, or the war on terror. At the same time, there's concern about China. There's concern about Russia. There's concern about transnational crime and cartels. Uh, it seems to just be exploding everywhere. And we're hearing the Canadian Armed Forces not only doesn't have enough people, but doesn't have the equipment they need. Uh, CBC ran a report, my friend Mary, Murray Bruce, uh, the reporter over there, that 58% of the Canadian Armed Forces equipment, according to an internal report they obtained, um, could not be used. It's unavailable or unserviceable. That's pretty remarkable numbers. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you spoke about the morale uh, waning in some areas of the armed forces. Uh, my experience is that if you're in the lower ranks, um, these are either an officer or a non-commissioned member, uh, which is the bulk of people in uniform, your morale isn't really based on what's happening in Ottawa and strategic decisions. You need to have equipment that works and an ability to train or deploy uh, to apply your trade. If you can do that, you'll stay with the armed forces no matter what it happens to be happening in Ottawa. The things that you're talking about are real. When we try and take 900 million out of this year's budget, 850 million out of next year's budget, it comes out of those very things that will allow people to ply their trade and get deployed. A lot of that great training we used to do in Europe was shut down last year because of the requirement to find that money. So I, I think that uh, you know a lot of these uh, large procurement items that we've just heard about uh, are, are big ticket items that show some promise both for the procurement system and for people who are going to join in the future. But we've got to make sure we keep who we've got in right now and uh, encourage a lot of others who right now aren't thinking of joining the armed forces of joining the armed forces. Is your sense that and I know the, the current Chief of Defence Staff has raised really serious concerns about this, that the Canadian Armed Forces could step up if, if there was a war, or are we in serious trouble? Well, unfortunately, you arrive at the party the way you're dressed. So uh, we're 16,000 short right now. That's how we get there. As you said, um, you know, for the for the very rawest uh, soldiers, sailors, airmen out there who you need very little from in terms of expertise, it's still going to be a year and a half training. Uh, for a fighter pilot on one of these uh, F-18s or F-35s that we're going to have uh, in a little while, that's more like five years. So that sort of lead time is something that we have to be concerned considering all the time. And that suggests that you've got to reinvest in the bases, the wings, and all of the training facilities right here in Canada. Again, the money would stay right here in Canada. Do you think that we're going to see, and I'm asking you to put on your uh, <laughs> General Lawson psychic hotline hat here, more money in the budget for the military? Or, or do you think that that's something the government's going to put off again? I think uh, politically uh, over all of the decades that I've ever been in the forces, 
uh, our political leaders um, charge to the front of what the constituents want. And constituents in Canada typically are far enough from any fray that defense is, you know, they're fine. They respect defense. They loved us when we were in Afghanistan. Some of that affection is left over right through to today. Respect is high. But putting ahead of things like health care, housing, education, policing, no, you don't normally see it. But we are starting to see it now. And when you start to see polls like we've recently seen, where 45% of Canadians are now pro-defense to the point that they want to see reinvestment, now a leader in, the, in uh, politics doesn't have to be rogue and teach constituents where they're going to put the money, which we've always argued for. Please try and teach people on the ground, your voters, that we need this. Now you can follow those constituents and put money, reinvest, as so many are asking us to do, including uh, NATO. General Tom Lawson, thank you so much for joining us and your insights as always. Great to see you. A pleasure. Thank you. Up next, how far is Defence Minister Bill Blair willing to go to fix the forces? For this week's One Last Thing, we're going to show you a bit more of that discussion I had with Defence Minister Bill Blair at the Ottawa Security and Defence Conference. I doubt you missed the gasp that went through the room. It is normally quite sedate conference when you talked about the military not moving fast enough, in your opinion, to get people in, perhaps rejecting people who you believe should be in. I have absolutely no intention of lowering the standards. We, we expect excellence in our, in our armed forces, and, and that's what we should seek. And frankly, you have to figure out how to go fast. And there are, there are processes. And I'll just give an example. The, the permanent residents that applied, um, we've taken more than 14 months to, to begin processing those people. Um, most of that time is being spent in background checks. There, there are ways to expedite that. One of the things that, that I, was, I was told uh, by the military is, you know, if, if we hire them, we're stuck with them forever, like we own them forever. And th that's why they're so cautious. And I said, well, in every other profession, and certainly the profession I come from, I spent 40 years in policing, we had a probationary period. And, and we, we bring people in on probation. It gave us an opportunity to find out if they were right for us or if we were right for them. And at the end of the probationary period, we'd make a positive decision whether we were going to retain them. The vast majority of them stayed. A lot of the folks I talk to who are leaving say they're leaving because they feel unsupported by this government. They think that the government doesn't take defense seriously, that there's not going to be significant money in the budget, that their equipment continues to fall apart, and it is a very slow process to replace it. I mean, ammunition is an example of that. Do you think your government bears any responsibility for the way that folks feel about joining the Canadian Armed Forces or getting out before their time is up? You know, of course. I think all governments mine previous governments for decades bear, bear some responsibility for the current state of preparedness of the Canadian Armed Forces. Um, quite frankly, when, when I was given this job, I, I was given very explicit instructions, go get things done. Move as quickly as possible on the necessary procurements. Work with the Canadian Armed Forces to deal with issues of, of retention. The people that wear those uniforms are, are, are the most important resource that we have. Investing in them, supporting them, making sure that they're, they're equipped and capable and trained and able to do the job that we ask of them is, is our, our greatest responsibility. It's a responsibility I share with all the people here in uniform, um, but it's, 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 it's a responsibility that we're going to respond to. That was Defence Minister Bill Blair in Ottawa. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you again next week.